minutes, we start with the QGIS and some part. This afternoon already? Oh, sorry, yes, it is. Well, another time zone. Um, okay, sorry. Yep. I assume that all of you have either a working uh, uh, virtual machine with QGIS or a local installation. I would suggest probably to use a local QGIS installation if you can, because it will be faster and easier. But either way, it should work. The data set that we are going to use are relatively small footprints, small size. Cool. Can I? Thanks. And um, I will be switching between the, the PDF and the virtual machine. Um, this will be run uh, together with uh, Mario and Trent. And you're very welcome also to uh, join in. It follows uh, essentially something uh, slightly similar to what Trent did. So going from raster data to vector data to uh, OGC uh, web services of different kind. And uh, we will also uh, not only touch WMS, which are already you are experienced with, but also WCS and few others. Um, we, are, we have no time to do everything, uh, and probably we can uh, skip through some steps. But the tutorial is made in such a way that you can follow it, and you can uh, follow what is written in each slide. Um, I think we can skip this. It's just for your information. But if you want to access the VM, these are the credentials. And the data already listed. Uh, I suggest that if you are stuck in any of the tasks or the exercises, just raise your hand. We can stop. It doesn't matter if we make one or two tasks less. But at least if you are at the same speed, at the same rate, that will be helpful. Um, QGIS, it's a free open source GIS that is available since a few years and is constantly improving in terms of features. I mean, I admit that I'm not a QGIS power user, so we try to put together something that to complement also what ArcMap or ArcGIS as the products do. Um, but lately there are quite some plugins and features that are very useful for planetary application. Uh, I skipped through this because in, in principle you should be done. Please stop me if you are feeling uncomfortable. And just to mention the few differences between FGIS and QGIS. Of course, the price and the license is open source and is free. Um, the interface looks very similar. You probably have it open already on your computer, and you will see in a moment in a screenshot. Uh, um, it's modular, so one can add functionality. Uh, one can also develop functionality, but the, user, the, the average user will just add what someone else uh, programmed, typically in Python, but not only. Uh, and plugins can add like extensions on ArcGIS functionality to QGIS. You can change the language of the interface, uh, but it's very similar. You have the usual menu, the toolbars, the table of contents on the left when you put the layers, and then the map area. And then you have a status bar on the bottom that shows, for example, where you are, and some measurements, the scale, and so on and so forth. And or uh, information on the CRS, or coordinate reference system, the projection, so to say. You can change the language if you like to. And as Trent mentioned for ArcMap, with QGIS, whatever you can deal with with GDAL, uh, QGIS can also do. Um, so since GDAL supports PDS data, and if PDS data are map projected, for example, the HRSC level three and level four that you can download from the PSA are map projected, then you can just get them out of the box on the system. Um, for each slide, you will see where you can get your data. Um, the file system of your virtual machine has data mounted on slash data, or slash, uh, um, I'll show you in a moment. So, here you got different folders. You have CTX, Arise, Global Data. What we are going to do now, no, we don't want to update, it's to look to uh, just load some global data. 
paesi. It's reasonably fast. And in order to add, add data, I can do it with the point and click with the um, keyboard shortcut. And the keyboard shortcut is indicated here. Control Shift R, or you just add it with layer, add layer, add raster layer. Try that. And then we go on data, on global data. Here we have two files. Actually, the second file is some metadata that have been created by QGIS itself, and it's a cube file. So it's IC Street cube that loads. Do you have the same image? Okay. Now, <coughs> the projection of this, you can figure it out in many ways. You can go with the properties. And it says that it's, this is a proj for code. You don't have to worry about that, but it's a way to uh, display projection information in a relatively simple fashion. And that's also what, uh, uh, sorry? So what we can also do, we can add another layer. For example, on the data, I want to add HRSC. Now, what do I have here? I have lots of stuff. Um, we don't go into detail of file naming conventions, but essentially, what is marked as RE4 means four level for data, which is auto rectified, and RE means red. So it's a red image. It's like an high rise. It's just one of the band of HRC. Um, this is BL is blue, uh, GR is green, DA it's uh, actually a molar aeroid like um, equipotential surface um, image. So topography, sorry. So it's the topography referred to the aeroid and not to the sphere. What you see as DT is the topography uh, uh, referred to as spheroid. This is the name of the orbit, just it means that each band, which of course has the same number of line and samples, we'll see in the next step, it's coming from this orbit and this, from this data product. So you see that we just loaded a cube file, so an ISIS3 file, now we load an EMG file. Do you see any difference? on your computer, it's good. I mean, if you see difference, there's a problem. If you don't see any difference, it's good because it means that, okay, fine. But um, here I wanted to point out two things. First of all, that you didn't see difference because they're essentially the same vertical reference. So the color code of your Z is the same. And the second one is actually they are lining up properly. This is because although they are originally with different uh, coordinate uh, reference system, uh, the, the GIS is able to do the on-the-fly reprojection. Yes? Okay, this may be the case that your QGIS, you install it by hand, eh? yeah. that the on-the-fly projection is not enabled. Yeah, for example, if you go to the properties, sorry, you see, if you click on the, on the bottom bar, this is, you click here, and you see if you keep the mouse on, mouse over, you will see the project for code, which is the projection of your layer, of your layer that gave the projection to the old map. If you click here, you can enable this. If you, if you use the VM, it's already set. If you're using your own QGIS installation, maybe that's not set, and you can do it. If you do enable it, everything will line up properly. So, uh, is it better now? Angelo. Ah, okay. So at the moment, it's just overlay of layers. And these layers, they're actually the same type of data. They are iroid reference topography, but they're just coming from different experiments. One is a degraded laser altimeter, MOLA, 
and the other one uh, is uh, a stereo-derived topography, HRC. So this is coming from PDS, the upper one is coming from PSA, although PDS has the same data as well. Uh, we had a look at the CRS. And uh, this is the typical Proj4 code. Uh, it's relatively easy to understand. So, is, of course, there are abbreviations. They're not looking uh, very straightforward, all of them. But if you read plus Proj equals sinu, it's a sinusoidal. Uh, uh, um, lat underscore TS is latitude of true scale. Uh, uh, lat zero is the central latitude. Uh, long zero is the central longitude. Um, x zero and y zero are eventually offset in x and y, and all these projections are metric. So the coordinates are not degrees in this time. This is a metric projection, they are in meters, typically. Uh, a is the semi-major axis of your reference spheroid, and B is the semi-minor. And to make life easier, as Trent mentioned this morning, if you use as reference body a sphere with A and B, which are the same, life is much easier. Um, plus units means that the units are in meters, that you already knew. And then no depths, so it's just an additional one, one can, I think can skip it even. Um, there is the coordinate uh, uh, system can be selected, can be varied, similarly to SJS. Um, and one can also add custom special one. For example, my favorite one. I like to have a polar stereographic and I want to be, without typing the project for code, I want to have it on my QGIS and use it when I need it. This we just displayed. The on the fly capability. Now, uh, in, in the case of an equirectangular, which is a particular uh, type of cylindrical projection, uh, this is a general proj4 code, uh, formula for a projection. Uh, for Mars, one could use 3396190, for the Moon, uh, 17 something, <coughs> and so on and so forth. These are all known, and they're all listed in this website. Uh, so you can write to Trent in case. Uh, so there are many, they can be updated, uh, but in principle, you can write your own, uh, uh, provided that proj4, which is a library, which you can download uh, and use separately by QGI, by, from QGIS, uh, is supporting it. Now, once you have few raster data, so some matrices, some images loaded, uh, and in a geocoded fashion, you can do things with them. Um, I mentioned here in this kind of typewriter font uh, um, some GDAL. GDAL, you know, is the geospatial uh, data abstraction library. Uh, which is a library which is very useful. Uh, it's, it's actually the, the library that lets you load those data on, on, on um, QGIS. Uh, but there are many functions uh, within this library that allow for uh, uh, oper running uh, operations of any kind, mathematical operation on your raster data, uh, doing uh, subtraction, multiplication, or uh, doing something more advanced. For example, computing hill shade. The very same thing that, uh, that Trent was showing on ArcMap can be done with a command line or with a front end. So what QGIS does is simply using buttons and let behind the scenes a command run on the terminal that you don't see. So this is uh, different things that we are doing. The first one is very easy and we want to create an RGB. But the problem is that when you download it, you remember the WMS of Trent from Mars? It's already RGB. The problem with HRC is that RGB is not built. You have to make it yourself because you have each band is separate. So you could do it from the terminal. You can even try if, you're, if you want. Or you can use one of the built-in functions which are doing the same stuff. And one can look from the raster menu because you are looking at raster data, merge. And once you do this, uh, the data, of course, are in slash data, slash HRC. Once you do that, you have a dialogue and you can select the band. It's important that you select them in order, red, green, blue. Typically, RGB is the, the, the bands that you select, they are in this order. Otherwise, it won't look Martian, it will look a bit odd. But it's good to test it.
Yes. No, 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 no. I, actually, what I'm showing now in a second is the graphic one. But of course, uh, it's sometimes it's faster to do it via command line. But um, for example, we go to raster. What did I say? A miscellaneous and merge. Now, one can even do it based on a directory. For example, merge all the stuff that is in a directory. I will not do it. I will just select the data. And uh, I go to HRC. And what do I have here? First of all, you see, they don't show up. Why? Because they're cute. They're, uh, sorry, a PDS file standing, Jonathan. Yes, you can. Uh, basically, using the different zoom, you can zoom to layer with the right click. It's the very same thing of ArcMap. You can zoom to layer. For example, here I zoom to the, to the extent of the HRC DA4 data for orbit 360. Uh, but let me go back to the, to the merge. I choose the file. Again, I have to go here. I have to look for them. All files. What do we have? Red, green, blue. Pay attention. The order uh, you have. To, sorry, uh, of course you don't see me. You have to press uh, Control. Uh, you have to press Control and click. So you first you keep Control press. You click on, on red, click on green, and you click on blue in this order. You can also change the order, and you will have very strange colors. But that's fine. Once you do this. That's set. No data value, it's probably it works already, but you can put zero, that's fine. Um, and the output file, we want to call it, let's create a folder, we call it output. And we can call it like HRC RGB .tif. I would say, let's cross our fingers. <coughs> it's cooking. It's cooking. Wait. You see? Oh, no, sorry. I think I have to do layer stack. Wait. You see? That's the beauty of demos. Wait. Yeah, wait, you see, it's, that's what happens. Now, assuming that, so that's actually what, that's, that was what I was running before on the VM, and that's actually the result you should get. So. Yes, please. Oh, do you have this? Yes, I'm. I'm doing what you're doing. So I'm right. I right click here. Do you have this on the general one? Okay, cool. So now going back to what was supposed to be the result. Eh? Actually, one should do the layer stack so that you can stack the different bands to RGB and the default should work. Let's try it again.
I'm just trying again what I was trying unsuccessfully before. No, no, they are the same only. No, ah, maybe not. Wait. Wait, one second. No. Ah, that's uh, why. Uh, uh. So you see, there is computers, unfortunately, I always write. I was clicking, that's, thanks, Mario. You see, I was clicking on the orbit 334. And uh, it was smart enough by QGIS, it was still placed in the proper place and resampled, but it's the wrong one. So I should do this, this, and this. Yes. Now, if you cross your fingers, and we layer stack, and we use the default, and we say, please, RGB, to be nice to QGIS. Thanks, Mario. You're and now, It still doesn't look very good. That's strange. It is strange because actually it was working, so. Mm. Well, it's reddish, but it's a bit too greenish. Anyway, does anybody <laughs> reach a nice colored RGB? Or it looks ugly and green? It looks how? It's black and white, but because you didn't stack the layers. Do you, you did? So. Now, this is essentially what we've done also with our map. So I will tend to skip it because it's just creation of a nil shade, which is mechanically the same thing. But still we can try. If you go to raster, do you have this menu appearing on your machine? Tell me if you don't. Do you? So let's try it very briefly. The input file is topography, the output is out shade. Uh, it's a hill shade, you see, you can do more. But at the moment you use a simple hill shade. And the z, the z factor, you remember that you had to, to, to take into account a z factor before because you were working with geographic data in latitude and longitude in x and y, but with meter in z. Uh, this image in, in, is in sinusoidal projection, and it does as it does have x and y, as well as z in meters. So the z factor is one. Now, yes, it works. Yeah. yeah, good. Now, the slight problem we have now is the screen size. Hopefully, if I press enter, it works. No. Okay, it works. You will have the very same problem I have, and this will be uh, because our virtual machine has a slightly small resolution, so possibly you cannot find the button to press. But if you press enter, it will do the job. That's yeah, okay. And this time, HRC didn't betray us, and the hill shade looks like a hill shade. 
course, is the very same thing. You can think put things up and down. And once you do this, you can play with the transparency, you can play with the style the very same way. You can choose that you, you want to have a pseudo color, you want to classify it. And you want to have it transparent. No, it doesn't really matter. For you, you can play with the symbology the very same way. Of course, it looks horrendous because blue is high and red is low, so one should invert it. Once you do this, sorry. This looks a bit more user friendly. Where the blue part, the blue parts in Valid Marineris, they are the, the lowest, and on the plateau, are red. So we add again our topography. Don't worry, bear with us. Now, once we have this, we can go on the extraction menu of the raster, because we have a raster, and we can try and get some contours out. Correct? We have an input data layer. It's the only one, so it should be easier and cleaner. We want to have the output, and now we, we say it, we call it right, because the one before was wrong. And that's the tricky part that I didn't tick before. That's the problem with point and click, that you forget to point or click. Now, yes, of course. Um, the interval, I put it again at 500. And uh, now that I have the attribute name uh, um, set, the contours won't be just, um, we'll also have an attribute based on topography. And then you can classify them in a more meaningful way. It's cooking, there's this little spinning wheel. It's cooked. Now I have two layers. One is my topography, the other one is the vector. Yes. Now we open the attribute table, which is again a right click. Same story of the properties. There is an ID, which this you cannot avoid, it's always there. It's simply a sequential number integer of, that identifies each and every vector inside. And then you have the elevation. And now the elevation makes sense because it's spaced of 500. Okay, in this case, there. Man, there are many contour lines, of course, at 2,500, that happens. Uh, but if you scroll down, you will see that there are 3,000s, 4,000s, whatever. They are all uh, spaced 500 by 500 meters. And now, and this was the original question that was triggered, one can graduate by elevation, and one can choose uh, this one. I'm not sure if I have to invert it. Let's see how it looks like. OK. Now, in this case, what I've done, I said, choose the elevation field, and based on this value, you use this, this mm, color table, and you classify with five classes, and you see minus 4,500, um, which is the, around the floor of, of this chasma. Uh, it's blue, and the high part of the plateau, which is 3,000 some meters, is red. So theoretically, if we do this, we will have blue areas which are low, and red areas which are high. Sorry, I killed one contour. Does it make sense? So, 
uh, these, uh, yes, that's a good question. And of course, you can classify anything. You can classify raster, you can classify vector. In this case, uh, I just wanted to classify the vector based on an attribute. So it's not like uh, a color table for an image going uh, with a digital number, but it's actually a color table which is going from a certain numeric value. And in this case, I'm classifying a vector file and in the other case, I was classifying, or we were classifying a raster file. It's a different uh, uh, data model to represent topography. And in this case, we have used discrete lines that are telling us the contour. Of course, you can do both. Theoretically, I can even use the same scale for both, and then you don't see the difference because they have the same color. You can save a shape file, and shape file you can eat, and you can also save it KML, KMZ, and I think there is a list of things that you can save or export. Uh, let's try. Um, save as. Now, look. Uh, um, DXF. Uh, I don't know if the AutoCAD is saved with the 3D component. Probably, yes. Uh, KML, JSON, uh, GeoJSON. Yeah, so the, so the idea, again, just to repeat, is to you can add an attribute to the lines, and then you could select that attribute. Our attribute would be length. Anything less than a certain length would remo be removed. And so there are ways to do that, yeah. Yeah, so removing by length is a way to, it's not always the best way, but it cleans it up. Yeah, okay, length makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, the lines are not closed in the yes. area, not making sense. And if you have a well, even if they're not closed. Yeah, right. And yeah, so, you yeah. You lose something too much, but that's fine. Yeah. I wanted to save some time for Mario's part because it's uh, very interesting and I think it uh, shows. So let, let's see where we are. Okay. I think that we have to make some trade-offs. So this we mentioned, but we don't have to necessarily do it. You have the possibility, actually, when you have layers loaded, to do calculations. Similarly to what Trent was showing, uh, here it's a bit uh, um, less easy, I would say, but it's similar. Um, so that you can call a layer that is available, uh, that is loaded, and you can do operations. They can be arithmetic operation, differences, sums, uh, ratios, uh, or you can do, for example, in this case, uh, conditionals. If something is larger than zero, uh, um, then it's, you can do something. For example, you can multiply, you can use a certain value. This is reachable from the interface. I just show you. Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. It's more or less what also ACMAP does. Yeah, yeah. It's not so much different. And um, for example, with this one, I say that everything in this layer which is higher than zero is this layer, which means that everything that is lower than zero is zero okay. or is no data. So in this way, this is very quick and dirty, not very stylish way to think of landing site uh, landability. Yes, essentially you are masking. You are basically create um, changing or creating a new layer, uh, which is the original layer for the condition that you want, for example, for topography higher than zero. And then there is no data, it's masked out for the topography lower than zero. Because imagine that you want to land in a place and uh, you need enough time to, uh, to slow down. So sorry, the contrary. You have to be lower than a certain amount. And uh, you cannot land at the topography higher than one kilometer or two kilometer from the data. Point. If you want to choose a tough example, I will also ask a question. Yeah. So in this case, actually, the masking is the, op is, okay. is the opposite. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> With in this way, one can mask out areas that are either too low or too high, or they can be within some range. So you can, you don't need to only to, 
use a single condition, but of course you can have multiple statements here, so that, for example, you can have ranges. This is the only thing I wanted to, to do, if possible, and then we move to the scripting, uh, which is virtual raster and mosaicing. The good thing of, uh, of projected data is that you can mosaic them, although you will appreciate uh, photometric correction um, availability when it's there. And in order to do so, you can build the virtual raster. So you can point to existing rasters and uh, uh, have a small file which is pointing to the files and it shows up like a mosaic. The problem is that all of these images, or most of these images, they have a slightly different projection. Typically, in this case, they are in sinusoidal projection, and the central longitude, which by now you know that is the plus long underscore zero, it's an integer somewhere close to the center of the image. I don't know. For 360, I think it was 285 degrees of longitude. Uh, for these other orbits, it's something more. I don't know, 287 or 290. So if you try to do this, it doesn't look very good. But in order to have a reasonably decent virtual mosaic or mosaic, the very same way that you do with ISIS, you have to reproject. Uh, sometimes reprojection is called warping, but they're more or less the same thing. And uh, if you try that with available red bands, uh, selecting them, they should show up at the same place. Uh, just to mention, for you it's not really a problem if you just load them. Because if you just load them, your GIS system will place them in the proper place provided that you have on the fly reprojection uh, um, enabled. Let's give it a try. Now, I want to add this, this, so here I have the same bands, so they're all right the images from different orbits, which means that they're covered in different areas. Let's see what happens if they load them. You remember when this morning Trent was mentioning that no data is eaten and digested properly by your GIS from the cube files or from the PDF files? Here you don't even have to remove the no data because it's automatically, um, the sim is removed, uh, no, well, there is a sim, but the no data area is automatically taken care of and they're showing in the same place. The problem is that if you try to mosaic them, it won't work because they have each of, the dif of, of these images has a different projection. But you can change it. Should we try? It should not be too heavy on the computers. So we got this one, this one, so it's also control. Yeah. I think I want to do the batch mode, so we do it easy. And the output directory, so we, we, we also reproject the DA. We don't care, it's fine. We go in output. So, so we don't do it one by one, we just do everything at once. So in this way, I select a directory with all of my HRC data are. Each of them has a different projection. And I say just uh, change the projection to something else. Um, now let's be adventurous. Should we? I think we should. No, okay, we are not. 
I, I'm lazy. No, I'm not lazy. The thing is that I don't want to type everything. Yes, I am. Um, now, we choose to have an equirectangular, but we want to have it. I think we can remove it. Zero, zero, zero. Ooh. So let's see, let's see if we kill the machines. Should we try? So now what I did is simply to avoid typing everything, choosing a, an equirectangular and changing it a bit. So very simply, the projection name, the central longitude, sorry, the central latitude, the central longitude um, offset in X and Y, in East and North things, and then plus A and plus B are the, yeah. So, yes, they are. So now we are, if we are lucky enough that nothing bad happened, so I didn't mistype anything, if we press OK, there should be a reasonably long in, in seconds cooking time, and then we will have a directory filled with those data. Should we try? Tell me, should I press OK? Yeah, go. OK, so it's cooking time, and now the cooking is also some, some bar, some progress bar. So, so the difference here for QGIS to be able to do a merge to be able to do a mosaic is the images have to be in the same projection. Like so, ISIS. Like ISIS. ISIS has to be in the same projection and same resolution. Um, QGIS just has to be in the same projection. You got a warning. You should not worry about that. Because, of course, we just told the system, get the old directory and every file should be changed to this new projection. Obviously, some of the files in the directory are not image files. And those are, are creating this complaint. Good. Ah, yes. In this case, we also uh, change the projection of those inside. So let's make it cleaner. Where did we save it? In output? Okay, now you see, now they are aligned in the proper place, although we didn't enable on the fly. And the reason is that they have all of them the same coordinate system, so it's safe. I would say that in the last 15 minutes, since we have no time to go to the vector, we go to the scripting part, which is uh, complementing. And I would suggest that if there is time, Putting breaks, and you have any particular part of the vector tutorials that you want to go through, they are available. Otherwise, the, 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 the virtual machine is not dying, it's not expiring, you can use it anytime, and uh, the presentation should guide you through. Okay? So, let first of all, uh, does, do everybody at the, the, the PDF presentation? Because there is a small link there. How it close? Good JS? and then start with a fresh, fresh one. Angelo D, okay. So we are at the H2.8, I guess. Yeah, okay. So, let's go to the machine. No. No. Yep, okay. Let's open a new one. Okay, the, there's a small exercise that I wanna show you, <coughs> actually, I'm not a really expert user of QGIS, I'm a pretty new for Python too, I mean, one year more or less. But I put a couple of things together to show you how you can implement Python scripting in QGIS. I mean, you can do everything that we have shown you on the command line. You can load, change, uh, add color, everything <coughs> could be scripted. 
and in some situation it could be better if we make <coughs> automatic stuff for all the change to, uh, per reaction, add color, operation, whatever. The nice thing is that um, QGS has a, an integrated Python console. So I don't know if, are you familiar with Python a little bit or not at all, more or less? Okay, okay if you have a question, just ask me. Um, the good thing is that there is a Python console inside. The bad thing is that I don't like the Python console. It was a really hard to use. And then I asked Angelo to install an IPython console. It's a little bit more friendly. So you can play a little bit with the console. So if you click here, you see the mouse? Yeah. You have an IPython console here. If you click, it will open a console for you. So you can start playing around, stuff like that. And define variable, print variable, and so on. Okay. From here, you have access to all the QGIS routines, layer, everything. So to go into the tutorial, just go on the second slide. Okay, the point, I changed the, the, the stuff here a little bit. So if you click off one of those, yeah, yeah, hello. If it's working, should open or? Okay, let's copy the first part. Then open one browser, pass here. Oh, cool. Nice character. Huh? Now the problem is that the character are not preserved. If I copy text from here, it's just pasting. Mm, let's see. Okay, okay, cool. So if you delete the last file name. I make a small uh, wrap up for you. So actually I make, um, <coughs> I use the app Python to make the script and then I'm using the notebook, um, the notebook, iPython notebook to show you a little bit what I'm doing. And you can choose if you wanna see everything together like a HTML page or as a presentation or uh, as a live iPython. So let's go with the HTML page the point is that we have to copy and pass code from here to the QGIS. And that's a problem, I guess, because now I am not in the virtual machine, no? Uh, no, but there is yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Let me see if I can do it here. Let's open up. There is a browser integrated in the virtual machine as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I don't know if I can, no, I cannot pass, cool. Uh, okay, How can I get the, yeah, okay, I know. Okay, 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 let's go there, there is a presentation that we are showing you. Okay, and then from there inside, It's too eight. Yep. It's there. Okay. Perfect. Okay. As I said, choose the first one. Whatever is working. The first one is just a list of code. It's okay. The font size. You see something? I guess so. Okay. I don't go too deep into the iPad and stuff. I just tell you what is going on. So the first part is just initialization and importing some of the library that we need. The important part is that one. We're importing all the QGIS function. It means that we can interact with the layer and the QGIS function for everything. So it's everything in this library. And then we are importing some other stuff to plot a little bit and to make an Omega manipulation. So I got to uh, copy the stuff here and then go to the um, IPython console and pass everything and enter. Okay, actually we just imported everything. And I, yeah, I try to explain a little bit. Then a second stuff, we want to load some data actually. So Angelo, you think that the path is correct? 
you know it by heart, I guess. Uh, yes, it's okay. It should work. Okay, then let's try to. Uh, we are loading here. That's the part that we are looking at. I'm using a little bit IPython magic. Actually, this uh, stuff here just do run some shell commands, so I don't have to add a lot of stuff to search for the file. List everything. I just using common shell commands, so I'm listing all the files that in the path defined here. With starting with the orbit 360. So actually, I'm loading everything. Then for doing a for cycle, I loading with a QJS function all the raster layer into the map that we open. After that, I will open a, a Mola a cube, define a nickname here, it's called Global Mola. After that, I redraw all the map to show you actually what we have done. So let's do it. I will show you underneath all the stuff. And hopefully, yep. So after with one script, we load everything. So as before, without clicking anything, we have the molar, and then we can see the single layer that we loaded. Okay, I mean, you're not supposed to follow every single thing that I do. If you wanna try to catch up, let's do it. But you can, it's fine if you just look to get, grab an idea what are you doing. So let's go to the, once again. Okay, then I define some function. For example, something useful, I want to uh, set the opacity of the layer that we are working with. So let's define a um, function. It's called set opacity, it's really clear. Actually, it takes a layer as input and opacity is a floating number. So we can choose between zero and one. And it just actually put, set the opacity of the layer to the opacity value that we choose and then redraw all the layer. That's the function. And then to actually do it, this string. So let's take a look. So we change the opacity of the first layer. So if you see the stack of the layer that we loaded, the first one is the molar. So actually we take the opacity down to, I guess, 0, 4. Yeah. So actually it's semi-transparent. You can see the other layer beneath. Other small thing that I've done is, okay, there's some useful stuff. Actually, we have just now uh, this canvas, uh, yeah, there are canvas layer with every, the properties and the layer that we loaded. I just um, print the name of all the layer and define the first layer as the MOLA layer, as the big round layer, and then query some properties like the width, the height, the extent, and everything. So just to show you that you can do query the properties of the layer from the command line. So see, that are all the name of all the layer, that's are the eighth of the width in pixel of the layer that we are referring to, that actually is the background layer, so the first one, the MOLA. And then other properties like the extend, that's a projection extension, make it bigger. And the band count, for example, so there is just one band. And the raster type, that's the number are described here. So if you wanna do something useful, okay, actually, I'm doing now the pseudo color palette that uh, Angelo did, did before. It was a little bit complicated. I just stole some code, an example for this link that's here because it was a little bit, uh, well, not that easy. I was thinking about it's just one function, but it's not. So actually, you wanna put some color. I'm defining the pseudo color based as on the MOLA elevation, so on the really height of the terrain. Yeah. No? So it looks nice, let's see, nicer as before. Okay, then that's more or less the, okay, more or less, that's just some example of the QJS the Q function. Then if you wanna start doing something else, so we wanna start to manipulate the data as number data, so NumPy is an extension for Python for numerical manipulation. We can import all the layer using the GDAL library 
into NumPy array and then start to manipulate it, so to work with it as data, not just as image. I mean, I'm a spectroscopist as formation, so I'm not working with image a lot, but a lot with the number. So here we can do both. So let's import the GDAL uh, <coughs> Python extension. And then what I'm doing here is um, define a new array, and there's a function to load each single layer. So you give him a layer, and it will load the data inside for you as a NumPy object. So it's a, an array at the end. And then I will load all the, all the array. Okay. Okay, I don't know why, I mean, if I call this function here, it will zoom to the full extent. If I do it on the one of the small HRS array, I don't know why it's not working, but maybe it's something linked to the projection. I didn't really work out why. Okay, now that we have a layer, or the layer uh, as a data, we can do some stuff. Let's see, for example, here I wanna show you how to make some statistic. You can do it also in QGIS, but I want to show you how how you can do some basic statistic. I'm loading the two uh, digital elevation model. One is referred to the iroid and one to the spheroid. No? Okay, I'm right. Then I define the X and the Y sides in pixel and then plotting some stuff. Okay, maybe it's easier if I show you the output. Yeah. Okay, so we have here the first one it's actually one, it's a small part, it's thousand per thousand pixel. <coughs> it's the array that I loaded. And I just show you, showing you how can I can show it as a, as a plot. Then I'm showing the two different elevation models together. I take one longitudinal, longitudinal profile and longitudinal profile. And the, okay, there's too much text, sorry. And the two curves are the two different images I loaded. And in the histogram part, actually it's the whole image as histogram. So you can see how the elevation is distributed in a simple way. I guess you can do it with QGIS directly, but it was nice to show you can do it directly typing your function and making some small nice histograms. And we are almost <laughs> finished. Another nice thing was to show, I don't know if it's really useful, but I found this little guy here nice. Actually, we are loading here the, um, the DT is the digital terrain model, and then I'm loading the infrared layer. So we have the infrared values on each pixel and the digital terrain model together. So each pixel has two different values. What I'm doing is actually plotting the two things together. So you have a profile, so you have the elevation here on the Y axis, and you have the color here color coded it's something proportional more or less to the infrared reflectance. So you see here, for example, that there are some areas that are really <coughs> darker in the infrared, so they have a lower infrared reflectance, for example, here. Or in this canyon here, you have the two walls with different infrared reflectivity. It could be related to different material, whatever. It depends on the exit position of the infrared band we're looking at, and you can have different absorption, for example. It's not really useful for science, but it's nice to want <laughs> to show. We are playing around. Okay, then the last thing, and then you can go to eat something and have fun. It's something that I really like, because it's my area. So what we are doing here is um, loading the different layer for the blue, green, and red. We already loaded the infrared, so we have four spectral points. And I show here directly from the, um, f that's for the camera data. I mean, it's, it's a uh, document definition. You see where the filter are. In nanometer, you have the IR filter that we are talking before. It's around one micron. So it's linked to the ferric absorption. So it's showing you how much iron, for example, you have. And all the other bands are on defined wavelengths. So putting this stuff together, we have for each pixel four spectral points. So after we have a really poor spectra, 
what I had done here is I put all this better together, I mean all the points together, and not showing you an image, but taking some of the points, actually one fifth of the all points are to show everything. But yeah, oh, too big. Okay, so actually you see, all the points that you see here are at fixed wavelength. Each line is one pixel. So per pixel, I took the different wavelengths and show you as a spectra. So actually you are looking at the same images as before, but as a spectra. And the color is linked to the elevation, I guess. So you see how different elevations show different spectra. The point that you are seeing here are the real point that you will see into the image if you put into the image. But there are another way around to look at the same image, but as uh, stuff we can use for other kind of science, for example, to look at here, as I say, there's a different absorption for iron, for example. And you can look at this band to look for rich iron zone or poor iron zone, and then different absorption going to the other side, to the ultraviolet at the end. So I guess it's more or less everything here. So, sorry if it was too quick, but I, I really fear that I cannot show you everything. So if you have some question, suggestion, or just trash everything and was too fast, you get an idea that you can use Python. That's, that's a takeaway point, that's good. very same task in a more programmatic way or in a more <coughs> hand uh, um, interactive way yeah. and both are, are okay depending on which are your needs yeah. so thanks and although we haven't we had no time to go through the rest um, I would suggest you a if you have any troubles with what we have done so far just to write on slack or get in touch so that we can iterate eventually and also try yourself to follow the the rest of the hands on.